Welcome everyone to the Atheist Society in Melbourne. Uh, we're very lucky tonight to have uh, Kat Parker to give us a talk. And I first met Kat several years ago and we had a secular party sponsored a conference, Ex-Muslims Speak Out. And uh, she was there and since I've learned that she's uh, with uh, the Centre for Inquiry Secular Rescue. So it's a very great pleasure to hand it over to Kit Parker. Thank you. Hello, everyone. <laughs> My name is Kat Parker, and I'm the case manager for the Secular Rescue Program. Thank you to John and the Melbourne Atheist Society for inviting me to talk today. Secular Rescue is a program of the US NGO Centre for Inquiry, which has been around since 1991. It was established by atheist philosopher and author Paul Kurtz. The Centre for Inquiry, or CFI, is a charitable non-profit organisation dedicated to defending science and critical thinking and examining religion. CFI's vision is a world in which evidence, science and compassion rather than superstition, pseudoscience or prejudice guide public policy. To move forward, we need to discard old superstitions, prejudices, and magical thinking and embrace facts, evidence, and crit critical thinking. The Secular Rescue Program is a small team. It's just two part-timers, me in Australia as the case manager and Matt Cravata as the coordinator of the program based in Denver, Colorado. First, I'll tell you a little bit about me. <laughs> I kind of fell into this work after assisting a secular rescue case with a fundraiser back in 2019, and I began working as the case manager in early 2020. I have a varied history with religion. I was brought, brought up in a Pentecostal church in the 1970s and 80s in Christchurch, New Zealand. Characters around the time were Ray Comfort of Banana Man fame, some of you will know him as he often attacks atheism, humanism, and believes in the snack portability of the banana as proof of intelligent design. People at my church spoke in tongues and danced with roses in the aisles. I remember they were very worried about witches sitting outside the church in their cars, casting spells on the congregation. They had good imaginations, that's for sure. <laughs> as a child, I would hear my mother speaking in tongues and I would try to copy her. I was probably like five or six at the time. Sheila McCunlia, McCunlia, McCunlia. Is this right? I would say, I need to get a no. You're not doing it right. I was bitterly disappointed at the time. When I was six, my best friend at school was the daughter of atheist parents, and they believed in evolution. Shock. I was so worried for her soul and that she would go to hell. I dragged her to the cloakrooms at school and told her she had to give her heart to Jesus. To which she said to me, what do you want me to do? Tear it out and hand it to him on a plate? To this day, I think it's a pretty good response from a fellow six-year-old. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to go out to my dad's garage when he was listening to rock music on the local radio station, 3ZM. As my mother scared me and told me that he was listening to the devil's music, after that, I distinctly remember having nightmares about Kiss. <laughs> the band Kiss, <laughs> just in case nobody knows. As a teen, I became a goth kid. I got heavily into rock music and played in bands. And so that worked out really well for my mother. <laughs> also, she wants me to tell you she left the church long ago. <laughs> this gothdom led me to my next religious experience of studying Wicca which I can say is just really just a nature-based religion. I quickly changed my mind when I failed my witch exam. I'm not sure what happened there, but I'm guessing I tried to apply logic. In those days, I visited, serious <laughs> I visited various psychics and believed in all kinds of weird stuff like past lives and tarot. Amongst the many char charlatans and deluded were other people with ulterior motives who sought to use fear to have power over others. As most of you know, religion too has often been used for control of the masses. My next and final dalliance with 
religion was in my early 20s. I became a devoted Baha'i for a few years. The Baha'i faith originated in Iran and is an offshoot of Islam. They believe in another prophet after Muhammad called Baha'u'llah. During this time, I met lots of Iranian Baha'is who had fled the Islamist regime and decades later would still receive threatening phone calls, calls from Iran. I think because of this immersion in Persian culture, I gained an appreciation for the Iranian people. The Baha'i faith in Iran is not allowed by the Islamic regime, and many were subjected to unwarranted arrests, beatings, torture, executions, and some even imprisoned for teaching Sunday school like classes and more. I was impressed by a book I read, Olya's Story, by Olya Rohizogin. I pronounced that correctly. It was a story about a Baha'i woman and her experiences at the hands of the Iranian revolutionaries in the 80s. She witnessed friends, neighbors, and relatives being imprisoned, tortured, and executed. Olya visited prisoners, comforted relatives, and then it was her turn. Again, those Again, with this religion, I questioned too much and found fault in the fact that women were supposed to be equal, but were not allowed to sit in the governing body, the Universal House of Justice. When I queried why, I was told to have faith and one day it would all be revealed. This was not good enough for me. Fast forward a lot of years um, to around seven years ago when I met my dear partner, James, so be here. <laughs> He often describes himself as a rabid atheist. <laughs> he introduced me to Dawkins, Hitchens and Harris. Dawkins' two documentaries, Enemies of Reason and The Root of All Evil, soon set me on my current trajectory. I must say, things are a lot clearer now. I have chosen critical thinking over imaginary sky daddies, prophets and psychics. Hey, back to secular rescue. <laughs> So our program assists secularist writers, bloggers, publishers, and human rights activists who are under threat of violence or imprisonment because of their non-religious views or activism. We work to protect atheist rights activists who bravely promote a peaceful, secular, and tolerant worldview through their writings and activism. Because we are so small but mighty, <laughs> We partner with many other organizations like Amnesty International, Humanists International, Pride Australia, and Faithless Sajabi, some members of which you will meet later. <laughs> Secular Rescue's program history dates back to 2015, 2016, when the Center for Inquiry campaign for free exp expression, the precursor to Secular Rescue, launched the Free Thought Emergency Fund to coincide with International Blasphemy Rights Day. This is celebrated on September 30th each year. Blasphemy and apostasy are two very important subjects to us at Secular Rescue. The vast majority of our work is concentrated in countries in the Middle East and North Africa, such as Pakistan, Iraq, Bangladesh, Jordan, Egypt, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Afghanistan, just to name a few. We have helped over 200 people over the last few years. It may sound funny to some of us in Western countries to talk about blasphemy, but without freedom of expression, our society could suffer greatly. In many Muslim majority countries around the world, blasphemy charges can come from just the smallest thing, like sharing a post on Facebook or disagreeing with someone about religion. Doing so could land you in prison, or you could be subject to the vigilante mobs chasing you down, calling for your death. The beliefs of one religion may be blasphemy to another, and that is why it's important in a secular society to maintain freedom of expression and ensure peace. Almost all of our secular rescue cases are apostates from Islam, or at least reside in Muslim-majority countries as most blasphemy, blasphemy and apostasy charges occur there. The definition of blasphemy. 
the act of expressing contempt, irreverence, or disrespect towards a religious deity, religious beliefs, or sacred things. The definition of apostasy. Apostasy is the formal disaffiliation from, abandonment of, or renunciation of a religion by a person. Any apostates in the audience? Yeah. Which religions? Yeah, and Christianity, Anglican, Catholic, 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 and what? And Pentecostal, yep. <laughs> Anglican. <laughs> Any blasphemers? <laughs> I'm sure there's some blasphemers in here from time to time. <laughs> I, I gave a talk taken <laughs> in biblical God. You what? Society. I gave a talk called the critique of the biblical God. <laughs> yeah. That would probably get you. Yes. Yeah, yes. Definitely. <laughs> okay. As of today, you can be sentenced to death for blasphemy in seven countries worldwide or receive a prison sentence in, in approximately 59 others and fines in around 20 others. That's 86 countries. Quite a lot. <laughs> and at least 10 countries around the world, apostasy is punishable by death. These countries are Afghanistan, Brunei Dar es Salaam, Iran, Malaysia, Maldives, Mauritania, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, United Arab, Arab Emirates, and Yemen. Over the years, we have worked with many different atheist cases, women at risk, LGBTQ, secular activists, and more recently, Afghan free thinkers escaping the Taliban. In countries where religious dogma is law, apostates can be fined, imprisoned, or sentenced to death. This seems shocking to us in the West. Religious beliefs should never be used to legally justify discrimination against others, but it's a cruel reality for many in the world. Due to these laws, many ex-Muslims are forced to flee their countries. That's where secular rescue comes in. But even once they reach a safe country, the struggle is not always over. In many Western countries, we often grant asylum to those who are persecuted due to their religion, but we do not grant asylum to those who are persecuted for being non-religious. This to me is discrimination. As we all know, the emphasis is on freedom of religion and not freedom from religion. Ex-Muslims in particular struggle with getting asylum and if they are approved, they are often forced to live with devout Muslims from their homelands in asylum accommodation, which further puts their lives at risk. risk. Ex-Muslims are a minority of a minority in the West. There seems to be a school of thought that if you're a person of faith, you must in be inherently morally sound and of good character, no matter which God you fear. For example, in the build-up to the last election, undecided voters were interviewed on the pros and cons of Albanese and Morrison. One woman claimed to be non-religious herself, but said she would likely vote for Morrison, as it seemed he was strong in his faith, and she greatly admired that. Considering in the last Australian census, almost 40% of Australian-born Australians claim no religion. It would be great if we could focus on bringing atheist refugees of conscious who are under threat of death or imprisonment to Australia for protection. Afghanistan is one such country where religious dog dogma is law since the withdrawal of foreign forces from Afghanistan in August 2021 and the Taliban reassertion of control of the country, atheists have been in desperate danger. Sharia law imposed by the Taliban consists of harsh punishments, including beheadings for ex-Muslim apostates and blasphemers. 
Atheists in Afghanistan have been hunted through door-to-door -door searches and when found subject to beatings, arrests and worse. The Secular Rescue Team has done everything possible to save as many lives as we can. After the fall of Kabul, the Centre for Inquiry was one of the first secular organisations to come to the aid of threatened Afghans. We expanded our cr criteria to assist both ex-Muslim Afghans and other Afghans on humanitarian grounds. While the rescues waited for the slow to process visas in to safer nations, we provided some financial assistance to maintain life. Meanwhile, we continue to work with NGOs, governments and civil society groups to get rescues to Canada, the United States, Norway, Brazil, Cyprus, Romania, Turkey, Germany, Australia and elsewhere. In some cases, we have been obliged to sign sponsorship agreements. When the opportunity to move arose, the Afghan, the Afghan fund provided resources for planning fears, passports and renewals visas and translation documentation and other related expenses. The most endangered tend to be free thinkers and atheists, pro-democracy advocates, anti-Taliban activists, ex-Muslims, former military personnel who worked with foreign forces, translators, journalists, women, girls and the LGBTQ community. To date, we have worked save around, to save around 130 endangered Afghan lives. Another cohort that we work with is ex-Muslim women at risk. It's particularly hard for women to escape from under the watchful eyes of their male guardians and reach freedom and safety. Some of the things they're subject to are forced veiling, forced marriage, rape, abuse, beatings, and sometimes honor killing. Many women just want the freedom to walk unveiled, go out unaccompanied, go swimming and ride bikes without their male relatives controlling their every move. One girl we are working with at the moment in Iraq was raped and almost killed by her father when she spoke out against him and protested for women's rights. The injuries he gave to her are some of the worst and most horrific I have ever seen and I'm surprised she survived. Currently, she is being held in prison on false charges, courtesy of her father, and we're still working to get her out. Her father has friends in high places who are making this incredibly difficult. Every lawyer who has worked with her has been threatened and some allegedly shot at. Another woman we worked with, we'll call her Sarah, was so pleased to have left Iraq that when she arrived in Turkey, she threw her hijab into the rubbish bin. The situation in Turkey is not great for refugees on a whole and even worse for ex-Muslim refugees. They often slip through the cracks and some are even deported back to Iran. Once that happens, it's almost impossible to get them out again. We have many Iranian cases in Turkey that have been waiting for the better part of a decade for their asylum cases to be processed. They have no benefits and no right to work, which puts them in a difficult predicament. Back to Sarah from Iraq. She spent the best part of a year in Turkey and because of the situation for refugees being so bad, and despite me warning her against it, she decided to risk her life and cross the border on foot to Greece. She was four months pregnant. I got a call out of the blue from her saying, she's lost in the forest in Greece somewhere. Her legs were all scraped up from bushes and she couldn't walk anymore. She was eventually picked up by locals, locked in a barn with many other asylum seekers and then transferred the, to the police station. We contacted a lawyer in Greece and managed to get her out after a week. She now has asylum in a safe country, but she was one of the lucky ones. There are also a lot of unsuccessful attempts. Airlines might refuse to let our cases board flights and they might end up in detention, especially if they're young and traveling alone with not a lot of luggage. 
One African case ended up getting locked in a Turkish airport for a month. And as much as we try our best, at times we're powerless to help. There's also people unable to escape because of risk or resources. There are young people I speak with in Saudi and other places. For example, there's a young atheist woman we'll call Amal, desperate to escape Saudi Arabia. Before her parents divorced, her father hit her fingers with a hammer when she refused to cut her nails. He shredded her textbooks and beat her after he found it that she handed out white, white Wednesdays flyers at school. These were protest, <laughs> protesting violence against women. She went back to school and reported her father. The school refer, referred her to a domestic violence centre. She told us that the domestic violence centre will call your abuser and make them sign a document that they'll never abuse you again, but then they send you right back to them. If you refuse, they'll take you to Dar al Raya. Dar al Raya is a prison for disobe disobedient women under the age of 30. Amal is still in Saudi, unable to escape under the strict guardianship laws. I'm not going to lie, the job can be at times overwhelming as vulnerable people pin their hopes on our ability to save them. I try to say I'm just a person here in Australia, I don't have any magical powers or connections with the government. There's also the toll of vicarious trauma in confronting the sexual, physical and emotional abuse suffered by our clients. Another young girl in Saudi sent me this message. I'm really tired. They beat me because they said I don't want to pray. My brother broke a glass on my head until I started bleeding. I'm scared they will kill me. I shouldn't I shouldn't have been in this world. I think they're right. I'm just a mistake. Women in countries like Saudi Arabia, Iraq and Yemen risk being locked in rooms by male relatives by just going to a foreign embassy for a visa. Another case of ours suffered forced marriage and abuse. She had false charges made against her by her father in her home country so he could mis misuse the Interpol system and re repatri repatriate her. With the help of Amnesty International, we managed to get her to safety, but it was really, really challenging, I'll say that for sure. We also have a crossover with many atheist cases who are LGBTQ. Many LGBTQ people from Muslim majority countries choose to leave their religion as their sexuality and life choices are at odds with the strict Sharia laws in the countries they originate from. A lot of them become atheists or agnostics. In many of these countries, there is capital punishment or prison time for apostasy or blasphemy and strict laws and punishments for homosexuality, not to mention the danger of vigilante violence. Some of the things that they're subject to are conversion therapy, forced marriage, rape, abuse, beatings, and even honor killing. The family members who enforce this usually explain it away with such excuses as she threw herself off the building or some other manner of suicide and get away with it. For example, a case of ours at the moment is a Yemeni lesbian couple and their two kids who fled their families in Saudi Arabia to hide in Egypt in the hopes of resettlement to a safe country. They have now been waiting two years. They suffered greatly in Egypt too, being beaten, attacked and bullied by the locals and have gone into hiding again after a recent failed kidnapping attempt by one of their brothers while they were, were, while they were shopping at the local supermarket. The amount of trauma these two women and their two children have gone through has almost broken their will to live. We are partnering with Amnesty International on their case and hope to get them to safety soon. Australia has a visa called the Special Humanitarian Program Visa for, for resettlement of cases such as these. And we have successfully had several approved through the small LGBTQ plus pilot program. We hope to work with Pride Australia and Amnesty International to bring many more atheists at risk LGBTQ 
cases to safety in Australia in the future. Um, I would like to introduce you now to two of our Iranian cases who fled to Turkey, Aras and Enzi. Hopefully they're still there. Can we turn the speaker on? With him. So I mute me. Is that right? On the phone, right? I don't know how to work this way. No, no, it's okay. No, no, it's okay. Hi, my name is Anthea. Yes, I'm so glad to see you. Can you hear me? I have no voice. So, NC, I think um, I can hear you, but I'm not sure if other people in the room can hear you. Thank you, thank you. All right, Hi. we're getting we're getting thumbs up. I'll leave. All right. Okay. Uh, I'm Encia, as I said. My English is not good, so I'm sorry. Uh, uh, all my goals in my life is fighting with, with religion, with uh, incorrect belief that in third world and middle east you know that uh, all the uh, harms for women uh, not just for women uh, but uh, most of it most of it and uh, i'm recently in turkey for two years uh, one and a half year uh, here is not good for an uh, atheist refugee. I'm say to, I say to you, it's not good uh, here. This co community in here uh, are building on Islamic beliefs. It's not matter uh, what they say on the uh, law books, and it doesn't matter uh, what the uh, all world believe. Uh, anything about Turkey, but here, here they are all of them um, against atheist people. I'm saying to you, I live with them, I work with them, and uh, not well, like in Iran, they they don't exude us, but they hate us. They uh, all all things had to do uh, for reporting us to Iran deporting us to Iran, and I don't know what to say. I lost my word. <laughs> if you have any question, I'm glad if I can respond. Nick, did you hear me? Anybody? Yeah, we can hear you um, online. I think they could hear you in the room as well. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. We might need to do the questions and answers at the end. Mm -hmm. Could I ask you a question, please? Yes, yes, of course. Do you feel, personally, do you feel safe where you are? Do you uh, feel, uh, I don't understand. Uh, Sorry. Do you, do you feel safe where you, you are living? Are you safe? Uh, 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 here now, uh, I'm safe in my home, but in the, uh, in, at work, if I let them know that I'm atheist, then they treat bad to me. You know what I'm saying? And 
I, I don't want to say they are racist, but um, for uh, making connection with uh, atheist people, they are known. They they have nothing known about atheism, uh, mm. and they hate us because they they think that we we want destroy their religion. No, I don't want that. I don't want uh, destroy Islam, uh, Christian or uh, Jewish people. No, but they uh, they they want that. Mm. Here in in Turkey. Um, no education about this. Uh, that uh, all I uh, I saw in that uh, one and year have I been here. Mm. Thank it's you. It's difficult living here. Yeah, difficult. Thank you. Um, and see, I'd have like I to ask. Um, there's a term that gets thrown around a lot in the West called Islamophobia. Um, what do you think of a term like that? You know, I'm uh, raised, uh, born and raised in a very religious uh, family. Uh, she and Muslims, they are so, uh, they have many, many rules for women. Uh, when you, you are six years old in Iran, you should put a scarf on your head and go to school. Uh, I asked uh, from my parents why I should that. Uh, you told me that uh, I, when I, uh, I'm nine years old, I should put a scarf. Why now? I'm sick. And they just told me, do it. It's law. I just was a six years old. Um, and I hate that law. Uh, Islamophobia in Iran. Uh, it's uh, in common with women uh, mostly because uh, because of you know that hijab and uh, no I have a choice for marriage no have a choice for any change in, in your life for works for uh, getting out uh, from country without your uh, promotion from your father or your husband uh, you haven't uh, any uh, you have any choice for keeping your uh, child your own child uh, if your husband uh, don't allow this and uh, you know this is make you that who I am now Islamic phobia I'm 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 terribly uh, have that phobia from Islamic Islam and Muslim people that hurt me a lot. My father that uh, hit me so much, so much for uh, in my teenager time. Well, for I'm not putting chador. I don't know what is chador in English, but that a long scar and it's black. You should uh, have to uh, if your father say. And if you say, I don't want to, you hit. I ran away from home when I was 13 uh, from my uh, hitting my fathers and all. I have six uncles and they are uh, so uh, telling to my dad that you should uh, do something. You should kill your daughter. Your daughter is uh, embarrassing us. I, I did nothing. I just don't want it. Hijab, I don't want it. Um, pray to God that I know it is it, not exist. I, uh, I have nothing to you. If you believe the God, I have nothing to do to you. Uh, you can believe God. You can believe uh, Jesus Christ. But you cannot uh, have me too that your beliefs is correct and uh, you hit me for this, you exude it for this, and you uh, get in jail. You put me in a jail for this.
podcast. I haven't your voice. Okay. Thank you. I'd like um, Aris to speak very quickly for a couple of minutes about his experience. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, an ate Iranian, Iranian ateist. Uh, before everything, uh, my apologies for uh, I, if I can't uh, uh, speak English well. I try to learn learn learning English. Uh, um, I activist uh, for um, ATS and human rights and uh, animal rights since uh, uh, 20, uh, two, uh, 2011. Uh, I start with uh, um, uh, explain to Islam and uh, Muhammad life Islam, lifestyle uh, in Facebook uh, since two, two, uh, 2000. Uh, eleven. Uh, I um before that before that in twenty thousand nine in uh, our university I have some conversation with my, my uh, friends student stu students uh, friends and uh, um, uh, anybody in uh, somebody in our university about sec secularism and uh, uh, secularism and uh, uh, ATS and uh, free uh, society. Uh, that day I under attack uh, with uh, and now uh, uh, and, and now uh, people and they. Uh, they uh, attack to me, and I uh, uh, have some uh, problem in my right hand. Uh, I had to uh, uh, leave my university, uh, and uh, uh, I, I, I love to study uh, in uh, university, and uh, I. Tried more. Tried to uh, enter to uh, university, but uh, it, it, it's about my health and my life. Uh, I uh, start uh, active, uh, act, uh, active for human rights and uh, uh, ATS. Eight years and uh, uh, explain to Islam. Uh, I uh, uh, mm, uh, under some uh, mm, uh, please wait uh, some uh, cyber mm, cyber uh, mm, uh, mm, cyber um, turtle. Uh, in uh, to, uh, 2011 to 2050. Uh, I arrested uh, in the March 20, uh, 2015 uh, by uh, Ira Iranian uh, uh, IRGC and Iranian cyber uh, army uh, and, and I was under Certain and inter uh, in inter 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 interrogate. Uh, uh, do do you give my point? Uh, for uh, uh, for four four days, uh, they 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 uh, ter ter me, and. Uh, uh, physical torture and uh, um, or uh, 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 physical torture and uh, uh, mental torture 
uh, in uh, to, to, uh, March 2015. I, I uh, escaped Iran, uh, escaped of Iran in uh, May, uh, April 2015, and I uh, mm, uh, several days in the way because I uh, I uh, uh, go out to Iran for uh, illegal illegal way uh, and I went I, I, I came to Turkey uh, in uh, May uh, 2015 uh, I went to a uh, United uh, Nation office, UNHCR in Turkey, uh, and they sent me uh, sent me to a uh, little city, and uh, uh, that's uh, the, that city is very little and religious religious city. I I had some problem in that city, and I have to I had to move to other city uh, uh, I uh, I um, uh, excuse me I have some uh, stress uh, uh, um, I living in Turkey for nine years uh, without any right without any um, any um, uh, human right? Uh, uh, do you know we don't have uh, uh, insur insurance uh, uh, for our health? Uh, uh, it means when we have some problem with my health, with my, our health, we can't go to uh, um, hospital. If if you if you go to hospital, you uh, sh you uh, you have to uh, pay more money uh, than uh, Turkish people. And we we, we have uh, uh, some problem in Turkey. For example, uh, it's very bad news. Uh, yesterday, the Turkish government uh, deported. Uh, to uh, 100 Iranian people to Iranian government. It's, it's terrible. And uh, uh, it, it, it's make me uh, very, um, uh, make me uh, 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 bad, bad, bad uh, feeling. Uh, I have uh, uh, two or three friends uh, who uh, are, uh, Deliver, uh, de uh, deported to Iran. Uh, one person of uh, uh, one person of this uh, friend uh, uh, right now in in, in the jail. Uh, name is uh, is uh, her name. Her, her name is uh, Otash. Uh, uh, he is my friend. He he. Uh, um, deported to Iran two months ago. I don't have any uh, news about uh, about him, him, excuse me, uh, uh, about him. Uh, I, uh, may I, uh, may I, uh, may I drink some water, excuse me. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> It's uh, if it if is uh, is it uh, enough? Uh, okay. Yes, yes, yes. So, Iris has been for nine years in um, in Turkey since he fled uh, Iran, and before he left, he was lashed, and there was all kinds of bad things. So he had to flee, um, and he can't go back there. There's a lot of um, cases just recently that um, human rights activists uh, that have been sent back to, deported back to Iran. So once they go back there, it's really hard to help them get them out. 
that's very sad. So hopefully we'll be able to get these guys resettled before um, anything like that happens, <laughs> that's for sure. Okay, so we've got one last speaker that will be Nick Forbes from, um, where did you go? Oh, there you are. <laughs> from Faith as Hijabi. Um, Nick, you go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, and just before I begin, I just want to say, um, NC, and thank you so much for sharing your stories tonight. So I think, um, I think everyone would agree that the bravery that you've shown is just absolutely amazing. And um, yeah, thank you so much again. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, okay, can I confirm? Can everyone? Can I confirm that everyone can see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Um, all right, great. Yeah. Well, I'll get started. So. Um, as Kat mentioned, my name is Nick Forbes. I'm the secretary at Faithless Hijabi. Um, so tonight I'll just be giving a bit of introduction about what we do as an organization, how we've partnered with Secular Rescue, and also I'll give you um, a couple of case studies of people that we've supported. So uh, Faithless Hijabi was founded in 2019 by uh, Zara Kay, who is a, a prominent ex-Muslim from Tanzania, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And if you're not, I'd really urge you to uh, follow her on social media and YouTube because she's doing absolutely phenomenal work. Um, but Zara left Islam because I think it, it was a very common story with a lot of people. It conflicted with her liberal feminist and pro-LGBT values. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Now, as we've heard tonight, ex-Muslims face a, a particularly difficult struggle when it comes to leaving religion. Uh, so it, it's, not a, it's not easy for any religion, but Islam prescribes the most severe of penalties. Um, and as a result, apostates often remain in hiding uh, for fear of facing ostracism from their families, incarceration, or even the death penalty. So one thing that often gets overlooked in this is the mental health toll that this can take on people. Uh, and as such, Faithless Hijabi was founded to support ex-Muslims and provide them with access to a licensed mental health from expert. As you can see here, um, these are just a few of the what we've been able to achieve over the last couple of years. Um, we've helped over 80 people that, who have gone through our mental health program. 76% uh, have been women, uh, with 20% 20% being men, 4% uh, being um, non-binary. But the idea is to help um, apostates create, basically have a safe space for them because some of them can't leave their homes. So they might be, for example, on their, their laptop in Saudi Arabia in their bedroom doing a session with one of our licensed therapists. Uh, but the idea behind the program is to provide them with a reprieve from the day-to-day -day, um, of their environment and a non-judgmental space where they can question their faith. Uh, and as mentioned, we have also supported a number from the LGBT community because uh, Islam is... Uh, particularly oppressive to this group. Uh, we've been very fortunate to be able to partner with uh, Secular Rescue, and obviously Kat has provided a bit of um, bit of information about what um, her fantastic organisation does, and we're really thrilled to be partnering um, with, uh, with Secular Rescue, particularly with the amazing work that they're doing, providing emergency assistance to writers, bloggers, and activists who face threats to their safety purely just because they've exercised their um, their freedom of conscience. What I'm going to do over the next few minutes is I'm going to share a few stories with you of people who have, um, that we've supported in partnership with Secular Rescue. So the first of these is Miriam. So Miriam was born in Nigeria and um, we've been really proud to be able to work with, um, with Miriam. So she grew up in a very conservative Sunni uh, community. She was forced to attend Islamic classes and forced to wear the hijab. And this is something she'd often question. She'd say, why do I have to wear the hijab? It's men who rape. Um, and she often said, she said something that stayed with me. She said that uh, hijab is something that limits women from attaining their true potential. As a result of questioning her faith, she faced violence and abuse from her Islamic studies teacher in high school. And of course, she found she eventually did fall into a depression. She was able to connect with Faithless Hijabi in early 2020, and she was assigned a psychologist who was able to help her to find herself again and 
this, she said that the program really helped to ease her pain and we're really glad to have been able to help Miriam. Miriam is really passionate about empowering people in her community. And she's since started an organization called the Learning Through Skills Acquisition Initiative, uh, which she has partnered with UNICEF uh, on to provide services and learning opportunities to women and children in Northeast Nigeria. Many of these people have been victims of Islamist groups uh, such as Boko Haram. Uh, Miriam has also supported many oppressed individuals in her home community, uh, including uh, Mubarak Bala, a Nigerian atheist. Uh, however, her commitment to human rights has uh, put her into the target and the firing line of vigilante jihadists and fatwas have been issued against her. I want to pause for a moment. This isn't because she advocated for atheism or um, openly criticized Islam. This was simply because she expressed solidarity with oppressed individuals. And as a result, um, we, we had to partner with um, uh, Secular Rescue to help her to leave the country and obtain asylum. It just wasn't safe for her to stay because uh, 12 of Nigeria's states have Sunni Islam as the dominant religion, and there was no way her safety could be guaranteed. Now, the next two cases I'm going to take you through, are uh, I've changed the details and I will be speaking under a pseudonym, uh, sorry, addressing them under a pseudonym. Uh, to protect their pri their privacy and their safety. So the next person I'm going to call Kara. So Kara is a Syrian woman who was subjected to abuse and house imprisonment by her family as a result of her apostasy. At one stage, she was locked in a room uh, for two months by her family. And during this time, her family urged her to kill herself to reclaim the honor of the family that she had brought into disrepute. Eventually, Kara was able to flee her home country and arrived in Africa. Uh, I'm not able to disclose which part of Africa she went to. Um, however, that particular country um, is also very hostile towards atheists. As a result, she faced discrimination as soon as she arrived, including abuse from asylum officers due to her apostasy. During this time, she was abused and taken advantage of by those who had initially offered to help her and she has since had to flee to turkey despite and despite this technically being a secular state uh, it is moving in a concerning direction towards it being a far right islamic theocracy and as we've heard tonight from two of our other guests it is absolutely not a safe haven for, for atheists to openly express themselves and the last person i'm going to speak about tonight is fatima uh, so there was actually Kat did actually allude to this case earlier. So um, Fatima uh, is a lesbian woman and with her partner was forced to flee uh, Saudi Arabia due to her sexual identity. Uh, she eventually hid in Jordan with the hope to eventually be relocated to a safe country. Um, however, this has not been, this has been going on for a number of years. And although Jordan is not as extreme as Saudi Arabia, LGBT individuals in Jordan still face uh, severe oppression. Uh, she's been beaten, attacked and bullied by locals and has even had um, an attempted kidnapping attempt. <coughs> Excuse me. So at the moment, uh, Secular Rescue is currently working in partnership with Amnesty International to uh, provide her and her, um, her partner with uh, safe passage, to hopefully to eventually to a secular country. So I think um, if I was just to conclude with my remarks tonight, um, it's pretty hard to contemplate what it would be like for your existence to be not only delegitimized, but to be completely illegal in result and result in very credible threats of violence. I'd also like you to think about what it would be like to fear this not only from your government, but from those you love, from those in your community, uh, from your family, and those who are supposed to love and protect you unconditionally. So take a moment to think about the bravery of people like Miriam, Fatima, and Kara, and also NC and Arsalan, who have been speaking tonight. These are people who refuse to accept what society dictated for them, and, but, and they bucked back against it. And there are millions of others 
in the Islamic world today who haven't been able to leave and may never be able to leave their oppression. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, the final thing I'd like to mention tonight is um, we are looking for proposers to help atheist refugees. Um, we've successfully managed to get three approvals so far in the past two years. Uh, and we have about 10 others processing. So we're looking for Australian citizens to help sponsor some of our cases. If you can help, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, thank you all so much for your time this evening. Um, do we have time for questions and answers? Yeah. Um, and Joanna, do you want to come up with a question? No. <laughs> okay. So has anyone any questions? But I would like to ask, I mean, what, uh, what can what more can we do to help um, i mean i'm thinking about it's such such a shocking issue in terms of the abuse of hum, human rights but in, in terms of the general publicity you find in the media it's like it doesn't exist so it's um, because atheists are a minority and even in Australia, and it's it's kind of a taboo subject to criticise religion or reflect badly on religion. I find that that that's part of the battle that we we're, we're fighting against. That uh, even in Australia, the the voice of ethics is not not respected and not uh, not accepted. So, what can we do? A really uh, mean a lot to a lot of the atheists out there and um, trying to find safety to um, if it's, anyone could step forward to be a proposer you just need to be an Australian um, citizen I ha have um, some sheets here that uh, Zara and I put together about proposing um, it's we often uh, at Secular Rescue will look after um, the flights, even though it says the flights. There's actually not many things on the list that you actually really have to do. But um, if you're interested, we'll just be really grateful because there's so many people that need help. And it's a really long process, so and they're not always approved, but <laughs> but we have to try. Yes. Um, there could be a, a, a lot of people that come, I'll repeat the question. Okay, so um, you were asking if there's any threat for um, atheist refugees that come out here from the local uh, population. The ones I know of, they have come here and made the, the tried not to um, have any contact with people from their countries. So the Afghans, they don't hang out with Afghans because it might get back home where they are. Um, so, but, you know, we, we have laws here to protect them, but there are still threats that happen. Actually, Kat, I wanted to ask a question. Um, with the rise of the Hindu far right in India, do you think there's the possibility that in years to come we might see an increase in the number of ex-Hindus having to flee the country? It could be. I mean, yeah, it's hard to say, but yeah, it seems to be, um, well, just in society in general, everyone seems to be um, quite polarised at the moment, no matter what subject it is. <laughs> Um, so um, that's hopefully hopefully that won't happen here, but you never know. Um, now I know I think it was Malaysia that has they they do have some. I don't usually get cases from there. Um, they seem to be further afield, <laughs> but um, there is definitely some difficulties there for. Um, well, thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you for having us.
the uh, lecture will be uh, the recording will be put up on the website at some stage. And just to notice that the Zoom link will be different from next month. So check the website to find out what the Zoom link will be for the next lecture. So thank you very much, everyone.